What's up, YouTube? Brian here. Welcome back to 1517 Films, where in every episode I'm always contending for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. And on this Thursday in the second week of Lent, we continue through the Gospel of Mark, and we have our oldest reading from an ancient church father yet. Stick around. <laughs> So as we go through the Gospel of Mark, we're, we're seeing people kind of pick up on things about Jesus. And he's not just doing these random things. They're deliberate, and they say something about him. So we're going to continue through the Gospel of Mark. We've got a church father from the 1st or 2nd century A.D., well, let's be conservative about it, the second century AD, and of course we're continuing on with our Lenten catechesis through the Apostles' Creed. So let's get started with the Gospel of Mark. Mark chapter 7, beginning at verse 24. And from there he arose and went away to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And he entered a house and did not want anyone to know, yet he could not be hidden. But immediately a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile, Syrophoenician by birth, and she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he said to her, Let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And he said to her, For this statement you may go your way. The demon has left your daughter. And she went home and found the child lying in bed and the demon gone. Then he returned from the region of Tyre and went through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. And they brought to him a man who was deaf and had a speech impediment. And they begged him to lay his hand on him. And taking him aside from the crowd privately, he put his fingers into his ears and after spitting, touched his tongue. And looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Epphatha, that is, be opened. And his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. And Jesus charged them to tell no one. But the more he charged them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. And they were astonished beyond measure, saying, He has done all things well. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. This, this is not an obscure statement here. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. These people who Christians or critics of Christianity will call simple, they really knew what they believed. They knew what they were waiting for. They knew the signs to look for. They knew the scriptures. They watched Jesus. As we're watching Jesus, we're watching him go to the cross. They're watching, not really understanding what's going to happen next because they knew the signs. They didn't know the end game. And that's why the end game was so unbelievable to them. And that beautiful uh, sermon Jesus preached on the road to Emmaus about how everything led to this. But this statement about letting the children eat first, that's a bit confusing. So Israel, the Jews, the people of God, this was God's holy nation, his his um his betrothed, his fiance, so to speak. Um, these were his people, and he came uh, to his own, uh, as, as John tells us. And then later, uh, after all of this, we would read the phrase, you know, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. So Jesus came with a specific purpose in mind, and knowing his own people were going to betray him. But the faith of the woman, understanding what he said, no, not, not you, not yet. That didn't matter to the mother. Her daughter was suffering. In faith, she clung to Jesus and said, Just the scraps, Lord, that are... F I know I'm a dog at the table of your people, but dogs get to eat the scraps. And Jesus, you can go home. Your daughter's well. You know, <laughs> it's not what we see in, in mainline cinema or, or the exorcisms that we see where they take many, many rituals these days. Nope, just... Jesus didn't even have to do anything. Just, your daughter's well. And all of this showing... Uh, who Jesus is, that he is the Christ, the Son of God, and report, recorded in John's Gospel, these, these things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Now, this writing that we have um, from the Epistle to Diognetus, 
uh, if I pronounce that right, uh, comes from the second century AD. And this is important. And you can see I've got this book here, this um, Apostolic Fathers. I highly recommend every Christian have this in their home. Now, this is not scripture, uh, but this is, well, Christians, we read, don't we? We've got lots of books. Now, the question is, do you have a lot of Joyce Meyer books or do you have a lot of apologetics books? Do you have a lot of doctrinal books? Do you have a lot of books that embrace the whole history and heritage of your faith or just what the modern popular ones are preaching today? Well, Apostolic Fathers is what the ancient church believed. So this is, and this, what's written, what we're going to read here briefly is so much better than anything any modern Christian has ever written. So I highly recommend this book because it's an insight into the mind of the early church that was truly taught by Christ himself and the apostles. But when, on the one hand, our unrighteousness was fulfilled, and it was completely obvious that its wages, punishment, and death was to be expected, then, on the other hand, the time came during which God had decided at last to make clear his own benevolence and power. Oh, the exceeding favor for humanity and love of God. He did not hate us, nor reject us, nor hold a grudge. But he was long-suffering and patient. Being merciful, he took up our sins himself. He himself gave his own Son as the redemption price for us, the holy for the unholy, the incorruptible for the corruptible, the immortal for the mortal. For what besides his righteousness could cover our sins? In whom is it possible for us lawless and ungodly men to be justified except in the only Son of God? Oh, the sweet exchange. Oh, the incomprehensible handiwork of God. Oh, the unlooked-for kindness that, on the one hand, the unlawlessness of the many be hidden in the righteous one, while on the other hand, the righteousness of the one justify the many lawless. Thus, having proven in the former time the inability of our nature to attain life now, having shown that the Savior has the power to save even powerless things. For both these reasons, he willed that we believe in his benevolence and think of him as our nurse, father, teacher, counselor, physician, mind, light, honor, glory, strength, life, and that we not worry about clothing and food. So this incredible quote from the second century AD about how the early church saw that this this um, this great exchange, this happy switch that the many be made righteous by the obedience of the righteous one and the, the that we are incapable of saving ourselves and Christ has done it all for us. This theology of the ancient church is substantially better than I don't know um, faith healers that can cure ADHD but can't cure a woman with a missing limb. <laughs> I refer you back to our gospel reading of Mark that Jesus did these, these great miracles and these great healings and the false charismatic movement of today. They cure the unseen and then they never follow up. And we never hear back from the people about how it didn't work, although sometimes they're quite vocal. So our Lenten Catechesis, we continue uh, on the second article of the Apostles' Creed. And as I've said before, and I'll say again, if you struggle to preach the gospel to people, memorize the Apostles' Creed, because in this, you can proclaim the whole gospel. So the second article again, And I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. From the large catechism. Let this, then, be the sum of this article. The little word Lord means simply the same as Redeemer. It means the one who has brought us from Satan to God from death to life, from sin to righteousness, and who preserves us in the same. But all the points that follow in this article serve no other purpose than to explain and express this redemption. They explain how and by whom it was accomplished. They explain how much it cost him and what he spent and risked so that he might win us and bring us under his dominion. 
It explains that he became man, John 1.14, was conceived and born without sin, Hebrews 4.15, from the Holy Spirit and from the Virgin Mary, Luke 1.35, so that he might overcome sin. Further, it explains that he suffered, died, and was buried so that he might make satisfaction for me and pay what I owe, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 4, not with silver or gold, but with his own precious blood, 1 Peter 1, 18 through 19, and he did all this in order to become my Lord. He did none of these things for himself, nor did he have any need for redemption. After that, he rose again from the dead, swallowed up and devoured death, 1 Corinthians 15, 54, and finally ascended into heaven and assumes the government at the Father's right hand, 1 Peter 3.22. He did these things so that the devil and all powers must be subject to him and lie at his feet, Hebrews 10.12-13. Until finally, at the last day, he will completely divide and separate us from the wicked world, the devil, death, sin, and such. Matthew 24.31-46, 13.24-30, 47 through 50. Yes, the entire gospel that we preach is based on this point, that we properly understand this article as that upon which our salvation and all our happiness rests. It is so rich and complete that we can never learn it fully. We pray. O oh Lord, let your merciful ears be open to the prayers of your humble servants and grant that what they ask may be in accord with your gracious will. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Until next time, may God richly bless you in the grace and mercy won for you by Jesus' vicarious death on the cross for all of your sins.